away we go. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, for being here, uh, for uh, for my part of it at least, or for staying around. And uh, I know you guys uh, just had a great time with with my friend Michelle. Um, so let me uh, let me get into it. I will. I, I just want to um, introduce myself, just in case if if you haven't met me or if I didn't see you earlier this morning. I'm Carrie Marsh. Um, I arrange music for uh, vocal jazz ensembles. Uh, and uh, publish uh, publish all that music um, on a website. It's uh, it's my name.com, so it's carrymarsh.com. Looks like this, um, and uh, you know there are a bunch of little. These are all little different uh, charts that you can check out, and and uh, one can click on one and go you know, look at these little score flippers and you can just browse a bunch of different music. There's like 250 different, uh, you know, pieces of music that you can listen to and they all have full demos and you can check them out. So um, in case you're not aware of that stuff and you would like to have, you know, sort of an additional um, resource for, for learning about vocal jazz music, that's one way you can do that. So, um, you know, uh, doing all of the, the arranging and, and the publishing and stuff involves recording it. And uh, we do that, my wife and I uh, do that in this room right here. I'm in my home studio. Um, there's, there's other kinds of work that's involved, a lot of administrative work and paperwork and licensing and things like that. But uh, we won't get into that stuff today necessarily, unless you really want to. It's, uh, uh, it's a fairly tedious, boring stuff, but the music part of it, of course, I love. Um, it's amazing that I get to work with my wife. Her name is Julia Dollison. Um, I think she's one of the, you know, really great jazz vocalists around. Um, she happens to also be a really great arranger, too, so we have some things in common, and we just love, uh, you know, we love this part of music and, and making music together. It's been really um, rewarding for us over the years. So my hope today uh, with my time with you is to give you an idea of what it's like to be a vocal jazz arranger and the kind of decisions that, that uh, we have to make in the process. Just so you have a sense of it, uh, I, I'm not going to be giving you all of the keys necessarily in a short period of time to uh, you know, how to do all of it, of course, because that's, that's sort of a, a life's work. It's a course of study, all that. But it's something that I've had you know, at the center of, of my life for the past, you know, roughly 20 years, a little bit more. Um, but I definitely want you to know that you certainly don't have to spend all of your time uh, arranging, you know, and making it your profession um, in order to, to be an arranger. You can certainly um, contribute to the, the body of work of vocal jazz music um, as, as something on the side. In fact, um, most of the time that I've been arranging, I've had other jobs. Um, it, it, whether it was teaching or being a banker or something. And, and I want you to know that uh, musicians generally wear a lot of different hats. Uh, you might be a performer, composer, arranger, educator, clinician. I mean, it's, that's what uh, Michelle and I are, are uh, doing here today, you know. Um, and uh, I think you should probably aim to be good at written and verbal communication skills. Those kinds of things are going to be helpful. Uh, you should be able to plan ahead, uh, have lots of spreadsheets and things. I think that's useful, uh, you know, and, and to be able to work with other people. That's that's an important part of it, too. Um, so it's just that's just kind of the, the overall picture of the, you know, the thing generally. But to focus just on arranging itself, um, I want to try to give you a real sense of those decisions um, that go into the process, you know, starting an arrangement from scratch getting all the way to the end so that a group can perform your chart uh, and be successful with it. You know, we're trying to give ensembles like your ensembles, we're trying to give you opportunities to uh, excel and learn some things and also have fun and to communicate and, and sell, uh, you know, sell the audience on whatever story the music um, is, is helping you sell, you know, some story, moving people from point A to point B. Um, you know, I think, some of the skills required, I, I'm going to talk about some of the skills that you should have for this profession. And at the top may be surprising and it may not. Um, it's, it's, it's piano, um, you know, probably just like you were, you were hearing um, uh, about improv improvisation, like having some basic piano skills is pretty useful and you don't have to be a virtuosic jazz pianist, um, but it is incredibly helpful to know enough about how jazz theory works so that then you can relate it to the keyboard, which lays it out, you know, beautifully and, you know, visually there's a symmetry to it. 
Um, it's great to play guitar and, and horns and other instruments, but, but your ability to lay things out at the piano um, really, really does help because of the symmetry of, of the instrument. Um, and it's also how we put the music oftentimes into computer notation. Um, if you're doing the work at, at uh, writing a chart and you have the physical dexterity, the, the muscle memory to find chords at the piano, at the keyboard, um, you know, th that will help you to do things like improvising uh, new ideas at the piano to come up with something that might go into an arrangement. Um, it's composing in real time in that case. Um, then you slow it down from real time and you write it down and, and nuance it and, and make adjustments and all that. Um, so uh, the, the, the second part, you know, just like in any form of musical performance, to be a composer or arranger, you, you will want to have listened to as much of the type of music you're working in as possible. You really want to, you know, dig deep into the history of the art form that you're working in so that you kind of know the context. Um, there, there is a, there is a, um, there's a tendency to want to be a maverick and entirely and to not connect with that history. And I, I know that general youthful instinct, uh, but I, I've, as I've gone on, I, I realized that in order to be speaking kind of the same language as other people have done historically, you should have it in your ears. Um, and so, um, for example, in vocal jazz music, you really want to be familiar with the arrangements and the recordings of, uh, well, the arrangements of Gene Perling and uh, his, you know, work with the High Lows and Singers Unlimited. Uh, his name is spelled P-U-E-R-L-I-N-G. Um, and it's an important, in, he's, his is a very, very important name. Um, one of the real founders of the kind of music that we're engaging in and that we're talking about today. You're going to want to know Manhattan Transfer and Take Six and New York Voices, uh, you know, the real group. Um, and especially today, and many of you will know about Jacob Collier, um, his work, you know, he's, he's famous on YouTube and Instagram and, and recently TikTok. He was doing some live arranging there just a couple of days ago. Um, I hope you know about him. He's, he's really revolutionizing what seems to be possible uh, in music creation writ large, like generally. Um, and uh, uh, my friend John Stafford, uh, director at uh, Kansas City, Kansas Community College, they, he just wrote an arrangement of one of Jacob's tunes and uh, his, his group performed that. That's something that uh, we got to hear this morning um, from, from their group. And I mean, it's just totally amazing. Uh, it's, it's often hard when you listen to really complex, uh, intricate music to imagine it being performed live. And, uh, and of course, they, they pulled it off. It's doable with skill and and enough practice you know so although you might not be aspiring to write music that sounds like any of those groups or writers it's important that you have an awareness of that music going in um and uh and it isn't to say that you should only listen to vocal jazz it, that's all i've mentioned but there's a lot more of course you should be well versed in a variety of of music not even just jazz um you know having a, a real awareness of uh, pop music throughout the ages and, you know, bluegrass and classical music and all kinds of stuff will inform the, the kinds of sounds that you can put into your writing and, and hopefully give you um, some, you know, some real interesting colors and something to share with people. Um, so I, to me, I, I feel like vocal jazz uh, music has a big, is a big tent genre. Uh, it lives in the schools uh, largely, and there are some pro groups, of course, that I mentioned before, but it really does live in a school setting where, you know, where we really um, get to work on this kind of music. And so I think it's really good that it's, it's a diverse kind of music um, and, and that it brings in a lot of things that you don't think of as really jazz, but um, that, that can be uh, great for listeners, great for the you know, students, for you guys uh, who are performing it. And then the final real quick uh, required skill that I'll tell you about is, is essentially just computer music notation. Nowadays, you have to use computer music notation as the final step, at least in, in presenting your music. Uh, you have several good options. Some of them are even free. Uh, I use Sibelius. Um, but uh, many people use Finale. That's a great program I used for a long time. Um, there's another one called Dorico that's on the scene now. Um, uh, and there's a free program you might be more familiar with called Muse Score. There's a website. Um, you, you can access it online. You can download it. You can upload to a big collection of, of, uh, of music that people have done. It's kind of open source. It's, it's like the YouTube of music notation, kind of. Um, whatever the case, though, it's important that when you're arranging, 
you are not letting the form of notation you're using slow down your creative process. Uh, because, you know, if your musical mind is working really fast, but your notation skills can't keep up with that, it's kind of a bummer to have a good idea just sort of vanish into thin air because you weren't able to sort of capture it in time. You were, you were trying to figure out if you push, you know, Alt X or Alt C or something like that. So when you get real fluid with those programs, then um, that can be, uh, that, that can be, you know, um, it's possible for you then to go straight into the computer. Uh, but a, a lot of a lot of times you'll hear you'll get the advice that you should go to handwritten notation, which is another skill. Uh, but handwritten notation first to scratch out your ideas, and uh, some people will continue to do that even if they're really skilled at computer notation. Um, all right, so I'm talking a lot, but we'll we'll get into some more interesting <laughs> stuff aside from me just droning on. Um, we have the we have the skills in place there, right? Um, the the question I often get if I if I just opened it up to questions. Uh, which, by the way, that I've got chat open. If you have questions and you want to, you know, have me grab that, I'll look over at a, at a stopping point and and answer some questions if I can. Um, just so you know, um, I often hear the question from folks, uh, you know, wh where do I start uh, if I'm going to write an arrangement? Don't you want to know where you start? Um, I, I used to say that it depends. Uh, entirely, but that's kind of a bad answer for, for these moments. I mean, the truth is it does depend on a lot of elements, but I do have a solid process that I'm going to go through with you um, uh, from now on. <laughs> We're going to start talking about that. We're going to talk about the decisions. Um, there's an order of events once I open a, a, uh, once I open a project, a Sibelius project, but uh, and, and I'll talk that through as well. But let's just say that you're wanting to write a chart for a, your vocal jazz group at your school. Um, and it's gonna have soprano, alto, tenor, and bass parts, you know that much. That would be like, you know, four part writing is really common, but maybe you're gonna even split it up and you're gonna write soprano two stuff and baritone stuff. For the, for the chart we're gonna look at today, it's gonna be a real advanced chart that's in six parts. Um, and uh, so, that's, let's say you're going to do that. You're going to do like I'm, I've done here and, and you're going to write a, a six part chart that sometimes goes to four and all that. Uh, let's say you want to include rhythm sections. So piano, acoustic bass and drums. That's a whole thing of study. You'll spend time looking at those kinds of parts, learning how to notate for them. I'll show you some today. Uh, there are specific things that they need, information that they, that they need to have. Um, you're going to want to know the song, obviously, um, that you're going to be arranging. So you decide on that and say it's a, we're, today we're going to say it's a standard called just one of those things um, because it happens to be a chart that I wrote in the past year. And, you know, I could there's enough uh, interesting stuff in there that I can uh, demonstrate some things for you. So um, so if, if you've just chosen, <laughs> let's we're choosing just one of those things. Um, the first thing to do, if you don't already know the song pretty well, would be to listen to a bunch of recorded versions of it, right? Um, that would be very, very useful. And you can find out kind of what treatments the song has gotten, you know, in history, in the past, by, uh, and, and, you know, and in recent times as well. Um, so, you know, you might go to your uh, Spotify or your iTunes music and do a search like I've done here for just one of those things. And I can see that uh, well, Frank Sinatra has, a, 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 looks like maybe a couple recorded versions of it here. Ella Fitzgerald has one, Harry Connick Jr., Peggy Lee, Blossom Deary, Jamie Cullum it has, a, has is going to have a modern version of it. But yeah, so we could, we could listen, uh, we could listen to a little bit and see some of the differences between how they've approached this, uh, this song. So let's just skip to the kind of the middle. Oh, if my audio is gonna work, there we go. Just so so here's Sinatra. Crazy flings, so what, take an accounting of what's of going on. That now and then ring. It's a steady medium swing tempo. I mean, medium, just a little medium up. One of those things. It was got a big band in the background, it sounds like, right? One of those nights. Cool. And we're going to speed run this a little bit. We're just going to go through this kind of quickly. Ella Fitzgerald, same thing. What did she do? As Columbus announced when he knew he was bound. That sounds like the verse. It was swell 
So Ella is singing the verse at the beginning of the song. It doesn't just start at just one of those things. Don't forget to drop a She's singing the verse. You can decide, do I want to include the verse in my arrangement or not? And then so on. You could listen to Harry Connick Jr. for maybe more of a, you know. Just one of those things. Well, he's going to do a slightly faster version, right? It was just one. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Okay, so there's that. What's Jamie Collum do? He's he's modern and Feels has some like pop I've influence. In. Another verse. I'm going to skip. One of those crazy Ooh, even faster. One of those bells that so there you go. So we have we have a few different examples right out of the gate of uh, versions of, of the song that we're going to arrange, right? And we're getting uh, a bit of an idea of maybe what's been done. That should take a little while. That, that process that I just sped through should, should take you a little bit. Um, you know, you might find big bands, combos, all that. Gain familiarity with the song um, if there are multiple versions there. Um, then, if you can find some sheet music on it, that's really helpful. Sometimes you'll have a lead sheet. Sometimes you have multiple arrangements that already exist uh, that you can use for reference. Um, there's a process for um, kind of figuring out which one is maybe the most definitive version. I will tell you that, that it's based on using your ears and listening to some of the great recordings of the song and comparing it with the lead sheet and deciding, are they including all the chord changes in the way I want to hear it? That's a thing that you develop over time, uh, your ability to uh, sort of transcribe a recording, listen, you know, listen to it, decide is is... Uh, you know, is this what's on the sheet? And maybe you make some notes, decide really what's definitive and authentic to start from. Now, you might be changing all of it um, in order to write your chart. You might be getting really creative and doing something new, but it's good to know what's the definitive version. Now, I'm, I, I'm picking one that I don't know is really the definitive version on this, but, but, let's, but I'll, I'll pull up this particular uh, lead sheet that comes from a Jamie Abersold book. Um, um, and... Uh, so this is in D minor, it's, it's a, a D minor or F major. It ends in F major, so that kind of indicates that that's, it's in the, key of, in the key of F. But it was just, I would play through it um, and, and just maybe start experimenting a little bit as I'm playing through it over time. It was just one of those things, just one of those crazy flings, one of those bells that now and then rings just one of those things and maybe I start it was just one of those nights and I'm like I really like a fast version of this Cole Porter doing you know just one of those but fabulous flights and and so as I as I experiment with the tune I might even start you know I might just start playing around in the key that the tune's in I might change the key of the tune and see if it feels different in, in, in some other key um, and, and just get, uh, you know, get my head kind of wrapped around it and get into the space of the song. Now, you know, when you, when you watch cooking shows and uh, they, they talk about all the ingredients and everything and then they pull out the finished turkey or whatever it is. So I'm about to pull out the finished turkey here. Um, and that is in the form of the, my completed uh, Sibelius file of this. Now, this exists in the form of, you know, laid out sheet music, just like this. Uh, but we're going to look at it as you do when you're writing, which is in, in uh, <laughs> what's the term? Panorama mode is what uh, Sibelius calls it. But basically, it's, a, a, you know, it scrolls, it's scrolling mode to where you can look at it all like this. Um, maybe a little easier than trying to lay everything out um, initially uh, onto pages, because that's a whole different thing to think about. Um, but this is my arrangement. Now, the, the red stuff, like intro vamp and all that, those are my notes for you to, uh, you know, so that you know, uh, so I can kind of point some things out as we go. But for right now, um, here's what I would hear from Sibelius um, if I'm playing it back, because I've written the chart. If we hadn't recorded it, here's, here's what it sounds like. So I'll just swing. One, two, three, four, down, to get it, down, to get it, down.
Okay. So that's that's the sounds, you know, that's the sound you're hearing, the MIDI playback. Uh, as you're writing the chart, you might have that as a reference, and you have to then kind of uh, think into the recording process, not just the recording process, that's what I think about. I think about how is Julia going to sound on this? How is the ensemble I'm writing for going to sound on this? Does it fit the guidelines that I've been given if I have a commission? Uh, do their sopranos need to have this part of their voice featured and that and that sort of thing? Uh, does the rhythm section need more information on the chart? That, that kind of idea. But that's, the, that's what I'm hearing the whole time. And then we're going to go, after the chart is written, the, immediately we go into the recording studio, at least in this house, that's what we do. We go right to recording. Um, so I will export uh, export all the information that I need to export to get it get the music ready to go in a program that I, that's called Digital Performer. That's the one I use, but other people use Logic. Um, you, you might be using Soundtrap to do your recordings right now on the cloud, obviously, uh, but some people use Pro Tools and uh, Cubase and, and Ableton. Uh, so there are many different digital audio workstations. That's what we're going to record in. So then we'll take all that. I uh, will lay out, uh, make sure the rhythm section's in place. I send away the, the, a, a little bit of the rhythm section parts to a drummer friend of mine uh, who lives in Canada and he's all ready to go and he quickly sight reads and, and plays through my chart. He sends me back those files and then we start to sing. Um, and when I've sung all the guys parts, uh, the, or the tenor and bass parts rather, uh, and my wife has sung the soprano and alto parts, maybe any solos, we've taken care of all that, then we mix it and then the process is done. Here's what that results in. We're gonna actually listen through to this chart and then go back and talk about the elements of the arrangement. So here is, here is all of just one of those things. Da, 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 da. Sabe, <laughs> 
So that's crazy. It's actually one of the, I think, probably one of the hardest charts uh, I've ever written. <laughs> it's uh, it's really really intense. There's a lot to it, and 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 uh, I don't mean to I don't mean to show this to you in order and to say ah check that out uh, check out how complex I can write this commission. Uh, I wrote it once, and the person who commissioned it, um, a really great program in, in uh, Scarsdale, New York. Uh, Edgemont High School, she, uh, the director wrote and said, uh, we really want this to be like insanely hard. We just want it to be super, super hard. Um, and it was written for this year, like during, you know, distanced uh, recordings and all of that. Uh, I haven't yet heard how they did on it, but um, I, she's got a very, very good group. Um, I'm sure they can hang, but literally I, I was asked by the commissioner or the person commissioning the chart to go in and beef it up to literally add more stuff. That's why all that solely section stuff exists and uh, a few other things. So, I'm going to talk now, now that you've heard it, you've watched all these, the, the red words here kind of flying by, um, I'll, I'll talk about some of the elements of the chart, but first, because I want to answer that question of where do you start, I will tell you the order. Um, it's basically like this. The, the first thing I, I, I would have done, um, or probably did, <laughs> I, I believe, was to kind of figure out this opening vamp. Now, if I'm going to write this, I'm going to write that vamp and I want to make sure that it, it can actually carry over into the, the melody of the tune. I, I probably would have written, I would have given myself some blank space for the intro, just blank space, write something here. And then I would have written, it was just one of those things. I would have written the melody, just one of those crazy thing, flings. I would have written that in and then I probably would have tried to see what fits. just for that opening figure so that I can overlap it. That's a technique I like to use. Intro idea that's, that doesn't sound like just one of those things. And then I make it fit for a little bit with the beginning of all the A sections of just one of those, of the tune. So it was just one of those things. It happens to work. It's a reharmonization. That's the term you use there, which by the way, if you try to type that into Microsoft Word or something, it, it puts a little red line under it because it's not a real word. We all have, have made that up as jargon in the world of, of jazz and uh, you know, in music generally to call it reharm or reharmonization. Um, that, that is though a term that we regularly use. So it's our jargon and we own it. But it is just to mean, uh, you know, a full reharmonization would take all of the melody 
uh, by itself and wipe out the original chord changes and entirely reharmonize, find new chords that can fit underneath to make it sound fresh or interesting or modern or sadder than it originally was or happier than, it, you know, that kind of thing. To change the mood, change the spirit, to surprise an audience that already knows the song really well. Um, that's that's kind of that's part of the idea of of reharmonization and the artistry behind it, um, and it's not everything. Not every chart I write is extremely reharmed, uh, but it's a thing I enjoy doing and, and that a lot of arrangers love to do. Um, that is a thing that uh, again, if you're a Collier fan, uh, you will likely be a really big fan of interesting vertical harmony. Um, that I have a love for vertical harmony too. Obviously, that's why I spend a lot of time thinking about it. So let's let's just take some of these notes. And again, I, I every once in a while I'm looking over at uh, at chat. So please feel free. Uh, at this stage, I'm just covering some of these different things. Uh, I might re, you know play them again, but um, but feel free to ask any questions that come up as we go. Um, I've written an intro vamp, some sort of an intro idea to set the song up to make it to where it's not just it was just you know like so there's some kind of uh, introduction to set up the mood of the song which for this is going to be ding 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 really fast swing remember we heard a progression kind of accidentally we heard a progression of faster and faster uh swing tempi uh and then uh, you know we got to eventually uh, a, you know column had a mm, two, three, mm, two, three, mm, two, three, mm, basically about this tempo it turns out so 254 beats per minute um, and so this intro figure that then I would have figured out, okay, that works over the beginning. Let me repeat that a few times. Um, and then I'm going to write, um, I'm going to write out a piano part and a bass part. I would write that in next and, uh, probably didn't write the drums next. I usually wait till the very end of the, well, almost the very end of the project to write the drums. And I start writing the voices. I like the idea of the lead being da, 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 da. And then starting to go higher, change the, the chords to make them be higher voiced chords and build, build, build until I finally get this, you know, really high stuff. My commission uh, was to, wanted me to feature a big range for their sopranos. That was the goal. And don't worry, you can give my tenors anything. They can sing really high. Yeah. So I know that going in and I do give them as much heavy stuff right off the bat as possible. This is supposed to be their opener. This is an opening chart. This is supposed to come out of the gate for them if, if they were performing live um, and hit everybody over the side of the head, just like, bang, 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 we're here, you know? This is the kind of figure you could theoretically in, a, in an opening of a set, you could just have this. You could say, please welcome the Edgemont High School Vocal Jazz Group. And then the rhythm section could ding, 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 ding. And then they could decide, okay, now we'll start. Da, 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 and they could start the chart really. So that's the intro vamp idea. It loops. It's a four bar expression here uh, that goes around and then we break out of it in a little bit. Um, other things you'll notice while we're here, I wrote chord symbols for the vocals. Well, that's useful. Uh, if I'm the director of the group and I'm looking at this vocal chart, I want to have chord symbols above the chart so I kind of know what's going on. So it's not just... And okay, tenors now, da, 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 you know, but I know that I can play and I can in rehearsal, let them hear the harmony. And if I'm a singer, I can see, let's see, I've got, oh yeah, I've got the third, da, 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 one, two, three, and I've got the fifth, da, da, da. And it's just, it's good to have that reference. Uh, it helps your ear training, all of that to have the chord symbols written with it. So that's not what everybody does, but I really find it useful to make sure I write the chord symbols for the vocal parts. I notate all the piano and bass parts, even on the hardest level five chart I've ever written. Now, <laughs> that is, that, that's not necessary because uh, all the times, because a lot of times if you're in a group that's this good, your rhythm section is probably very skilled too, might be pros that are hired out or might just be from your jazz band and they're really skilled or, um, I, I always notate just because it tends to help people uh, later down the road. So I spend the time and write out these parts. You may not have to do that really. You can do other kinds of rhythm section notation where you give slashes, maybe uh, other kinds of um, other kinds of uh, indications of where the chords might change. And then the musicians uh, that the fellow musicians that come in and play 
your arrangement um, will be able to, re we call it realizing chords. Like, you know, I can see E minor and I might, you know, might do that or I might go, you know, all kinds of different possibilities. But I would like them please to play that specific thing writ written out entirely for the bass, even when it's, I mean, literally every note is written out. Um, and then the drums, they're given rhythmic hits. They, they will see, I want, uh, 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 and the drums will do that. What's the drummer do in response to this? Watch the drum part and see what the drummer's doing. So they're catching all those hits uh, uh, while they're playing time. And that last, I gave them the, I gave them the hits of dun, 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 start going soft and building up real loud. Well, the, that's what he plays. And then he's, and then he continues to play. So there's that much. Um, moving on. I would like to point out that it's important as an arranger to indicate your dynamics, to write, I think, detailed dynamics as much as you want. And Directors, your director, or you, you know, you as a future director, you might decide that uh, you'd like to do different things with the dynamics. Of course, that's cool. Um, but I want to make sure that at least my initial ideas as an arranger are included into the chart. So I'll indicate subito mezzo piano, and then build, 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 build double forte, and then back down again, so that there's a lot of up and down in the chart, and it's exciting like that. Might be a long stretch where it's just mezzo forte, and there is for a while. Um, and then we pull it back a little bit to mezzo piano, subtle difference, you know. But I like to make sure the dynamics are included into the chart. Uh, double bars and rehearsal letters, very important um, to, to, you know, include sections so that, so that in rehearsal we can say, hey, everybody just start at letter A, uh, and it's very clear where you go because that's the beginning of the lyric, it was just... So I will make sure that throughout the entire chart, we've got double bars and rehearsal letters, even up to the last four bars. So if I, if I say, just letter U, everybody, letter U one more time, and I give everybody the notes and, you know, da, 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 and we just sing that. So it's for rehearsal purposes, rehearsal letters. And we want to be helping out the people that are putting the music together. So there you go. Text instructions for the drums down here. A lot of times we can't give the drums all of the information they need uh, by normal notation. It would be too much information to tell them what to do with their limbs at every moment. So we give them, we give them this. We say uh, hits, fills, and hints of swing time. I wrote that for uh, the drummer to, so that they're hip to the idea of yeah. I want it to kind of feel like there's a little time in there, but because because the rest of the rhythm section is going <clears throat> dun, 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 dun. then you really are mainly playing those hits for the moment. You're gonna walk later on. And when it's time to walk, I will tell them uh, that fill into walking time. And you'll notice this right here is where the bass starts going all four. Boom, doom, 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 where that's walking bass. And so it's a different way to play the drums when that happens. Well, the drummer needs to know that. So in my text instructions, I've I've made sure that that's really clear. It's 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 we do it all the time, and sometimes the way you write your um your text instructions can be very different from someone uh someone else. Um, I'm going to uh, respond. Uh, Jade says, big thanks for including the, uh, the symbols, Lal. Well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's my pleasure. Um, and uh, as an accompanist, yes, it's so helpful to have the chords in there. Uh, very, very cool. Uh, sometimes we'll, I'll create a vocals and piano part, a sub part uh, that's not the full score, so you don't have to turn as many pages. Uh, but I've started to do that on people's request. Um, and that's that's very useful. Um, and uh, Jamie asks, um, do you notate phrasing? Uh, I think I notate phrasing, but I don't do long phrase marks to do it. I'm fairly diligent, although I've noticed a mistake in this one. I missed one. Here it is right at the beginning. I'm usually fairly diligent about <laughs> writing all of my um, uh, slurs. Anytime there's a slur, like no word change, 
uh, I want to make sure that that's notated correctly. And that one just there, that there wasn't because this isn't actually published yet. Um, so because they're going things, I want to make sure they have a slur for that part of the phrase. Otherwise, though, I definitely always do indicate uh, breaths. I always think about how long uh, a group can breathe, uh, you know, how long they can sustain a line. If they can't, and I really don't want them to breathe, all right, stagger breathing because you're not going to make this. Um, but otherwise, I really think a lot about like making sure in ballads, especially to give to give pacing and to give phrasing um, a real consideration. Very good question. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so I, I I don't write long phrase marks over like you will maybe have seen in lots of other kinds of music notation. Um, you know, maybe choral music will do that. Piano music will do it. Um, you know, at this tempo, you can make, you know, one of those things. It was just one of those nights. Well, that you can make it at this tempo. So yeah, I've got about eight bars of a phrase that I can include before I need to give them a break. And I think about that constantly because it's so important. Um, all right, great questions. If they don't see it, uh, you demonstrate it on the part tracks, Dan says, and that's absolutely right. Yeah, um, so much about of the nuance of what we uh, want to convey to our to our audience, the people who are using the music, happens through the part tracks. Um, in fact, the demo as well, the drums, the way the drums play, I really count on the skill of my friend um, uh, Matthew to uh, to play really well according to the style of music that I'm trying to, to convey so that when the drummer, uh, when, you know, when they listen to it, they can kind of uh, get an idea. Okay, I see what they're going for. I see what, and then they, that, that's such a huge part of this whole process. Um, we convey technique, my, like my wife, Julia, she, she thinks in the studio, she spends hours and hours with each chart, making sure that she's going to uh, mixed voice at the right time, head voice to get the right tone. It really matters which register uh, the uh, you know, soprano and alto voices are in, um, because that's the big challenge. We know that around A or B, and we have to think about this as arrangers, around A or B, if you're a soprano or alto, um, you're very likely needing to mix, you go, you know, go out of chest voice and go into mix you'd otherwise break you know um and so it's you know a lot of that stuff does get conveyed in our, our demos and part tracks it's a huge part of, of our um communicating to students okay one of the biggest um thank you for you, uh, you guys comments and questions super keep them coming as you got them it's we're we're doing great um one of the big things that i really advocate for arrangers is to use part density changes throughout the chart go back and forth between unisons octaves two-part writing uh polyphonic writing three-part chord writing uh four part you know i'll say all the numbers five six seven in this case uh there are quite a few changes um we're gonna get this that now and then rings everybody comes back together that now, that now. And if I were rehearsing slowly, I could do that. I could say one of those bells. Okay, now that, that now. And that makes it so much easier for the ensemble that they have a pivot point of a, of a unison or octave note, and then they can bust into a chord. And I know the value of that from having taught for a long time and knowing that it just speeds things up for rehearsal to have that kind of um, attention to detail for voice leading and for, and for um, including uh, density variation. It makes the music more interest, interesting if it's not all four parts or all six parts the entire time. So this goes to three parts. One, one of those things is pretty, it's pretty sparse sounding after all that four part writing, right? Um, and you're going to see quite a bit of that changing throughout. Um, in this spot up here, um, a trip to the moon. Wide open, all fifths, um, and then on gossamer, and then wings, as clustery as you can get. With you know, within a couple seconds, or not even a couple seconds, one second later, moon on gossamer cluster, gossamer wings. It sounded to me like gossamer wings, it was shiny, beautiful, uh, you know, sort of uh, lustrous kind of sound. And so that just shimmered to me, and so I wanted that crunch between altos and tenors in that spot. That's an artistic decision. Uh, so real dissonance there, but right before moon, like it's, you know, all fifths, uh, just like it's a Aaron Copeland piece or something. 
And then another thing you can change uh, might be the meter. And so in this one part, we go to when you got a bit of the end of it, when we started, blah, two, three, one, two, three, uh. The rhythm section hits on the downbeats. The group is now lilting a little bit more and we've changed it. And the audience again is, is hopefully a little surprised by that. Um, a, a great question, J uh, Jimmy just said, uh, uh, Jamie just said rather, um, uh, when you're doing a commission, are there questions you always ask about the group and singers? Always. Yes, there are always questions I ask. Um, uh, sometimes they'll just, folks, if I've been working with them for a while, they'll, they'll know what I need to know right away. But um, I include a section on my website um, that actually lays out what I want to know from folks. Uh, if you go to info, and commissioning arrangement, it's down there. And these are the things, uh, you know, tell me about, okay, what's the song? What are the ranges I need to know about? Um, do you want any soloists to be featured and how much? Can I do my thing of going back and forth between a solo to an ensemble lyric to, uh, to have um, some texture changes and, and for it to be, you know, interesting and, and not monotonous? What's the general difficulty level? Like, as in this case, uh, this, this director said, uh, you know, let, let all the way, 100%, everything you got, write it like it's for New York Voices plus two singers, you know, like write it really aggressively. Uh, but sometimes people are like, yeah, I've got a bunch of freshmen in my group this year that have never heard vocal jazz before. Can you go easy on us? Uh, Oftentimes they will tell me which charts of mine or other people's they've performed in the past and had success with. And then it's very easy. I'm like, okay, well, I'll write it like, you know, Phil Matson's this or that chart or, or my, you know, uh, my chart on uh, centerpiece or something like that, 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 you know, has a lot of unisons in it and uh, that kind of thing. So that I will base it on that. Um, if it's a vocal chart, then if, is it rhythm section or acapella? That really very, you know, changes how I'm gonna write the chart. Uh, if it is rhythm section, what kind of rhythm section? Uh, do you have any limitations there? Are they students who are inexperienced? I need to be careful, all that. Uh, what's the voicing? Um, so those different things. And what clock time do you want? How much time in your set do you need to fill? People will be maybe performing um, at a, uh, you know, at a festival setting and they're timed and they know the rest of their set, but they need their closer. And it really has to be three and a half minutes and not a second longer. And so I can very easily figure that out. When I click on this note right here, down at the bottom of my screen, you can't see it, but it tells me time code 48 seconds. So end of it is 48 seconds into the tune. And by the time I get to the end, um, by the time the fermata starts, we're at four minutes, 50 seconds. Um, and if uh, you can see <laughs> the entire chart after the fermata, it is five minutes long. Um, and so if I'm performing at the same tempo that I'm notating, I know exactly how long the thing's gonna be. So that's very useful. Thank you guys for, for your excellent questions. Um, I think I've roughly 10 minutes left, I, if, if I'm not mistaken. So I'll just go, I'll just keep going. But, but again, feel free if you're itching to ask some question, I'd love to tell you about it. Um, revisiting the previous approach when we go, so uh, we've, we've got the so goodbye dear and amen. This is like almost exactly the same as we heard it before. And there's really something important to being an arranger and uh, utilizing material that you've already written later in the chart. And again, later, um, not just writing completely through composed brand new idea after brand new idea. It's a, it's a really good move to uh, have, have um, some recall uh, of, of stuff that you've already done. Um, first of all, for rehearsal purposes, it's like, oh, D is basically the same notes we already practiced. It's just different words. Make sure and say amen instead of amen, you know, like that kind of stuff. Like it's so much easier that you've already experienced that music. But um, there's just a balance there, you know. We want to surprise the audience too, but we, we also want to let them guess right some of the time and be familiar with what we're doing so that it doesn't all just sound like chaos and noise. So I'm revisiting this approach and reusing some material, nearly the exact same. Now, this chart has a very fast tempo. Um, and it allows me to do a second head in at the beginning. So I go, you notice, like it goes right to another time, back to the top of the form of the song. It was just, and now we're in a new key. Just one of those things. And we're doing a different thing. It's gonna be a solo vocal feature. Uh, I put it into a range that really works well with a soprano or an alto. 
Um, so it was just one of those things so, so that uh, they can sing uh, in, a, in a way that's idiomatic for, um, you know, jazz vocalists. Um, and uh, the, the ensemble now has totally been relegated to horn parts, basically. Like they're just, they're horns now, right? Um, there's, this is a texture change that hopefully, again, keeps the interest going. The bass is walking now, and they haven't been walking the whole time, but now they're just going. Drums swinging, not playing hits anymore. Spang, spang, lang, spang, lang, spang, lang. They're just going for it. Um, remind us of that part, Carrie. Yes, okay. Yes. Yeah. Just one of those things. Just one of those crazy flames. One of those bells that now and then rings. Just one of those things. It was just the same, same. one of those nights. Just one of Check those out going flights. A trip to the moon on Gossamer Wings. Just one. So as the as the ensemble is about to re-enter with some lyric at the bridge of the tune, I start to have them sing a few little words. Moon sounds like an ooh anyway, but that's fine. Fabulous flights. So we're doing a little more than horn work there. And then finally, if we thought a bit of it, this is kind of straight ahead vocal jazz. This is not reharmonized in this section. These are the changes to the song. This sounds like just one of those things, you know? Um, and so that that also, I think, uh, benefits the students and the, the listeners who might like the original tune. This sounds like the original now. You know, you've got some connection. It was all kind of angular, <coughs> you know, taken him by the throat and all that. Now you're just like, just one of those, you know? So it's a, it, it's a lighter mood and it varies things a little bit. However, when it finally gets to the end of this section, we are going to reuse that earlier motif. Um, and so when we get out of it, let's see, uh, where's that gonna happen? Yeah. And then earlier. And then, and then uh, somebody takes an amazing scat solo on this. They're so good. Okay, uh, just kidding. That that is uh, that. So you you leave some space for improvisation. That was a request for the commission. That's something um, that they wanted to do. Happy to do it. I love to have space for improv in these uh, in a chart like this. And then they get tons of space there you know for the first 16 bars there's no vocals anything it's just you know the the soloist and the rhythm section like a combo and then just to change the texture a little bit we're going to bring in some background figures here we build that texture we start an ooh and maybe we have a couple ooh dot and we stab with a little bright vowel once in a while but then we go back ooh, do, we, do, do, you know and we do our thing we step out you know let the soloist you know play off of that and then and then it goes on and goes on so Solo then winds down and letter M is what we call a development section. All of this stuff doesn't seem to have much to do with the original song at all. It's, it's developing brand new material and going in a bunch of harmonic uh, areas. This is the stuff I added when she said, can you please make it harder? Uh, and so this is that that is the, the material. And I call this a hybrid solely section shout section. It's kind of both. It's It's got elements of what we think of as a big band shout section with high parts that are reminiscent of the melodies we've heard maybe, but you know, with some new rhythms, maybe higher notes and all that. And a solely section, which would be like writing lines that, that fit, it's, it's as if a soloist were performing, but we all sing them together. Um, and so I like to write hybrid shout solis in vocal jazz. I do that quite a bit. And then sometimes there's just this type of, of, uh, of an exploration here. And I uh, don't even know. Yeah, here's, here's this section. Not even a melody there, really. We're just building to this. Solely line. However, what do you notice about this? What do you notice about, we just had chord, 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 and all of a sudden, the really hard thing to sing for each individual is sung in octaves, not in. I mean, if, if we had to sing four part harmony on that, yeah, it's 
it's something you could do, but it might not sound great in concert. So we let the ensemble sing in octaves and we make a decision to simplify something that otherwise is really, really too challenging uh, to do. Saxophone, you know, they're, they're pushing buttons and stuff. They're going to be okay playing that figure at that tempo uh, if it were harmonized, but I don't, want a bunch of, I don't want the singers to have to do that. So we write melody lines that work over this. We write it together. And then finally, ga, 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 and we bring it back to chords. I've written some polyphony here because I hadn't written it yet. So that means you've got uh, uh, some of the parts, the tenors and soprano ones are doing this da 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 da, while other people are holding out notes and then ba -ba -da -da, doing a run later on. Check that, check that out when it comes up. Oh. I think I went too far. Here it is. Here's the polyphony. Still polyphony. Back together. And then we simplify coming into a recap. And this is a, just a recap, recapitulation or a reuse of the earlier bridge that we had in three. Now it's in a diff different key, but we've, we've got that going on. Uh, it's a repeat. At the end, we're building on the earlier material. We're going higher. We've got big, exciting stuff. So goodbye, dear. Amen. It's meant to really, really build to a strong finish. And then we, we trick them at just one of those things. And we do a pullback right here that turns out to be a drum vamp solo, that one of the things we all love in, in jazz world, where the, the, there's a vamp being played. And they can go, and they start to play around the kit. And then we bring everybody back in. It gets higher and higher. It gets louder, louder, higher, faster, louder. That's the best kind of music. And uh, I'm being a little facetious, but... But dig this at the end. Here's the pull down. <coughs> so we hush. Everybody's like knees are bent in the ensemble, you know. We're real excited, but soft. We're building it up. More. Still more. Come on. And the loudest bit yet. Phil, Phil, Phil. <laughs> and that's it. Everybody, everybody in the group like fills all the way in the end. And all you got to do for them is just write fill and you play those same notes again and the drums go and the ensemble holds, holds, holds until they're blue in the face and then somebody cuts them off. Voila, that's it. There's my clinic. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks, you guys. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Dan, thanks, man. Um, I really, really happy, uh, really happy that you've joined us and 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 thank you for for taking part in Milliken Festival this year. I love the Milliken Festival. I love the school. I love the history. Uh, I, I love the groups from there. And I have so many friends that got so much uh, from their experiences uh, at Milliken. Uh, I, 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 uh, I just think it's a fabulous place. And it's really, really awesome that uh, uh, I got to uh, to be a part of this today. So thank you all uh, so much. Oh, and I should mention, Logan Ferris just mentioned uh, that I do live streamed arranging. I'll be doing them from this cool new uh, lit up environment from now on. Um, they, I'm going to be doing some this spring on uh, some easier charts. Um, I, and, and so if you want to learn how I would write some easy charts, just go to my YouTube channel. It's it's Carrie Marsh uh, YouTube or whatever. Um, and uh, it's it, if you subscribe to me there, you'll get notifications to know that I've just gone live. The series is called Behind the Chart. Uh, and I literally just sit just like this. I don't uh, I don't holler quite as much. Um, it's, a, it's a slower process. It's the kind of thing if you have to do some chores, you can put your iPad on and have your headphones in. And, and maybe if I do something interesting, you can go look at the screen or whatever. But um, it's, it's, uh, thanks for reminding me to mention that because uh, it's, it's a thing I, I like to do to demonstrate in real time how this music comes together. <laughs>